We continue on with our summer series, which is entitled Christ in Us, the Work of the Indwelling Spirit. And we're looking at that during the summertime. What exactly does it mean that the Holy Spirit of God has been given to us and he lives within us? And what is he doing in us? So we started out uh, by talking about the new birth, what it means to be born again. Jesus said you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter it unless you are spiritually born. Uh, John said, I baptize with water. He is coming after me, baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. And we saw as we kept our finger on the text, which is what we're doing to this, make sure we're sticking with what the Bible says and not branching out any sidetracks, we saw that that's exactly what began at Pentecost. That when Jesus, before he left them, one of the last things he said was, remember John said he'll baptize with water, but I'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's what's going to happen in a few days. And it did. That was the beginning of being born again. That was the beginning also of the new covenant, as we saw in the quotes that were made at Pentecost, identifying it clearly. Uh, Peter saying, this is what this is, what the prophets prophesied, that the Holy Spirit would one day be poured out. So that monumental event at Pentecost began it all. And since then, those who are truly in the kingdom of God, who are in Christ Jesus, have been born of the Spirit. And so that's... That's, that's, what we, that's where we started, of course. Where else would you begin with a study like this? And that is what Jesus called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of Christ, the entrance into the kingdom of God without which you cannot see the kingdom of God. We talked about uh, after that what the purpose is of that. If, if we become now the body of Christ and by his spirit Jesus lives with us, in a real sense the baton was passed from Jesus incarnate to his incarnate church. Which means the goal of all that is ultimately to be doing the work of Jesus, which is seeking and saving the lost. So the ultimate goal of the new birth is for his new body, this, this new group of people, to be doing his work of seeking and saving the lost. And then after that, we talked about how he does this by creating a new humanity, by recreating a people that together are radically different than the world around them, with an ability to do radical things like love your enemies and give even when you don't have much to give because you care more for the other person than you do your own losses. All those things that Jesus talked about as the kingdom of God kind of stuff now becomes a reality or can or should become a reality in us by the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. So that was kind of our first section. He invades and directs. We talked about new birth, uh, the purpose of it all, and the new humanity. The second section, he unites us. How does he do this? How does he make this new humanity? He unites us in love. And we see it saturating scripture, the importance of love. By this will all men know you are my disciples, by the love you have for one another. We looked at 1 Corinthians 13, which says if you have the most amazing gifts and most amazing ministries and you are just performing like an all-star servant of God but don't have love, it's all worthless. Shocking statements. But that the, the unity of love is how he is going to show this world he is still around in his body by us living that out. And then last week, we, we started on a three-week section on the gifts of the Spirit. And I said when I started, this can be controversial stuff. We are going to keep our finger on the text. We are only going to say what the Bible says and nothing more. And if you have strong views on the gifts of the Spirit, you're probably not going to like some of the things I say, whichever side you're on. Because the great division over gifts of the Spirit is not the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll see as we study it, the one overarching thing the gifts are there to do is unite us. And I said before, if you have a view of the gifts of the Spirit that ends up dividing into the haves and have-nots, you have not been properly taught. You've not kept your finger on the text. So last week, we looked at Ephesians, which you say, boy, why do you start with gifts of the Spirit in Ephesians? Well, Ephesians chapter 4 is really the foundational teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. It's a theological book, Ephesians. The first three chapters are good, true theology, truths of our faith. The last three chapters are how do we live it out? So we saw last week... That, that grace thing, that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, a gift of God, not the result of works that no one should boast, has as the very next verse, for we are his workmanship, we are his projects. 
that he has prepared good works for us to do. We are now his projects that we should be doing them. And as we went along and got into Ephesians 4, we saw that the direct connection of that is nothing less than the gifts of the Spirit. That's how we are his project. It's grace. We weren't saved by grace just to be, get a ticket to heaven. We were saved to be continually changed by the same grace. As he does his work in us, and we identified in chapter 4 of Ephesians that his work in us are the gifts of the Spirit that He has made us because it very clearly laid it out exactly what these gifts are. We have been taken captive by Christ. We have been gifted and given back to the church as gifts. Gifts are people. They're not these things floating around out there that pop up and down on us. They are attached to people. We've been taken captive, foundational teaching on gifts, gifted and given back to the church, and he lists some of the gifts. In fact, he lists those gifts that are the most crucial in the church, which are apostle and prophet and evangelist and pastor and teacher, the only gifts mentioned in Ephesians. It says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, and if you were here last week, that word equipping, the Greek word is a medical term that really means to set broken bones, to set the bones straight. So he gave those foundational gifts, those formative gifts to the church to set the bones straight so that all the other gifts will be carried out in proper order, that the, church, the body will grow as God is desiring it. And then, of course, the, the concluding statements we have in Ephesians 4, verse 16 from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. Here we have the body image begun that we'll look at more today in 1 Corinthians. That is every joint, as every part of that body is doing what they're supposed to be doing, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in what? In love. Ephesians 4, 16. That's the goal of the whole thing. The goal of the gifts is to build the body up in love so that we can be that new humanity for this world to see that will invite them to come in to the presence of the very Spirit of God. So that's what we looked at last week as foundational teaching on what the gifts are. Today we go to 1 Corinthians and we'll be looking at 12 through 14, focusing mostly on 12. We looked at really 13 already a few weeks ago when we talked about love. But uh, what, what can we add here? Now, one thing I did when we went to Ephesians, I said, before you take this passage, you better understand what Ephesians is, because one of the mistakes that's constantly made in the study of Scripture is we pull passages out of context. The greatest mistakes made in the teaching on the gifts of the Spirit have been taking that chunk out of Ephesians 4, taking the chunk out of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, taking a chunk out of Romans 12, and putting them together and say, what do they teach, without taking each one in its own context, because it can shade the meaning when you look at it in the context. And you will get what he's really trying to say instead of making their own context. So as we look at 1 Corinthians, it's a very interesting book. 1 Corinthians is one of the most, probably the most corrective book in the entire New Testament. The only one that's close to it is Hebrews that we studied uh, last year. Uh, in both Hebrews and in 1 Corinthians are the two places you see the accusation that you guys should be teachers by now, but you still need to be spoon-fed baby food, you're carnal, you're fleshly. And so the book of Corinthians is by and large a series of challenges and corrections for a church that was not where they should have been. 2 Corinthians is a very deep and powerful and spiritual book 1 Corinthians, they weren't ready for that yet. They needed 1 Corinthians before they got 2 Corinthians. So as you look through 1 Corinthians, they, they are, we are told in chapter 1, verse 7, that they were not lacking any gift. They were a very gifted church. However, if you go to chapter 3 and verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, let me take a minute as I go there myself. You see in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men of flesh, as infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able, for you are still fleshly or carnal. Since you are je jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? One says, I am of Paul, another, I am of Apollos. Are you not mere men? 
And he goes on in the, that line. So they had abundance of the gifts, but they were fleshly. And th there's one thing I want to point out. The presence of spiritual gifts has nothing to do with spiritual maturity. Spiritually immature people can get powerful gifts from God. The goal is to grow into those, and that's where the importance of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, for setting the bones straight by keeping your finger on the Word of God helps them to grow as they are called by God to grow. But as we go through 1 Corinthians, we see that they had their problems were division of pride, dividing up under leaders and teachers and theologies. Uh, sexual immorality that was not being dealt with, lawsuits against one another. They needed some teaching on marriage. They needed teaching on food and liberty, and can you eat that food, and, or should you not eat that food? They needed teaching on the orderliness of their gatherings. They needed teaching on the Lord's Supper that they were just botching terribly. And they needed teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, as well as the second coming of Christ and the order of the resurrection. All these things are taught correctively in the book of 1 Corinthians. So when we come to chapter 12, he is moving into the gifts of the Spirit. We start by saying this, beginning with verse 1, 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, the gifts is added there, spiritualities. But you can see as we go down, he's talking about the same gifts of the Spirit as Ephesians was talking about. They are called gifts of grace in Ephesians. That's where the word charis, grace, charismatic comes from. They are called spiritualities in 1 Corinthians, but you'll see that they're the very same things. Concerning these spiritualities, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols wherever you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit. Now, does that mean your mouth can't verbalize those things without Spirit? No, what that means is you can't say it and mean it and believe it without the Spirit. That takes the new birth. Now, let me point out something here, because it's consistent with everything else Scripture teaches about the Holy Spirit. He never points to himself. He always points to Jesus Christ. It's clear in the teaching of John through his passage to talk about the Holy Spirit. It's clear with what happened at Pentecost. They were filled with the Spirit. Peter stood up, and what did he do? Say, oh, this Holy Spirit is wonderful. No, he proclaimed Jesus Christ. And that's what everyone filled by the Spirit has done since then. They proclaim Jesus Christ because by the Spirit, we are the body of Christ whose goal it is to proclaim Him and bear witness of Him and seek and save the lost in His name. So the Holy Spirit always points toward Jesus, never to Himself. I'm always amused when I see things advertised as Holy Spirit meetings. Because Holy Spirit meetings are Jesus meetings. Or they're nothing. Because if the Holy Spirit is emphasized there, he never emphasizes himself. You'll never see that in Scripture. He emphasizes Jesus Christ because that's his purpose. He's the other like himself that Jesus sent so he could pass the baton to us so that the ministry of Jesus Christ could continue. Now, verse 4. There are varieties of gifts but the same Spirit. Varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. Varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. This is exactly what Ephesians said. He said there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, but there's a variety of gifts. The gifting of God is a wide variety of gifts, yet there is one. And the purpose of it is unity. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. What do we learn there? We'll keep our finger on the text. What's the purpose of the gifts? What did it say in Ephesians? For the building up of the body of Christ in love. What does it say here? They're given by the Spirit for the common good, for the good of the body. The gifts are never for our own benefit, with a couple minor exceptions. But ultimately, they're for the entire body. But Generally speaking, and almost exclusively, they're not for us. They're for the body of Christ, for the building up. For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, another the word of knowledge according to the Spirit, another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing. Notice the plurality there, by the same Spirit. To another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues. Uh, notice the plurality there. To another, the interpretation of, songs, of tongues. But one and the same person works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. 
In fact, if you want to jump down to verse 18, it says, Now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. What does that say about gifts of the Spirit? We don't get to pick them. We don't get to pick them. We don't get to decide what gifts we have. The Scripture is, is clear. It cannot be more clear. He gives them as he wills. It's that we are his workmanship. That's a, that's a passage that's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And according to Ephesians, we were taken captive by him, gifted by him in the way that he chose us to be gifted and given to the church. We don't get to pick him. If you have a theology that says you get to pick your gift, I just want to challenge you to go back to Scripture. I'm not trying to pick a fight here. Keep your finger on the text because divisions in the body of Christ have been caused by false teaching here. So we have this, this Holy Spirit who gifts us. It's a divine gift. There is one spirit. Uh, he lists some of these gifts again. He, he listed a few in Ephesians, specifically those that were the formative gifts in the body of Christ. He has wisdom and knowledge. It's interesting what people do with gifts of the Spirit instead of just taking them by what the Word says. A word of wisdom means spoken wisdom. Sometimes we tend to occultize gifts of the Spirit, like there, there's, there's these, oh, the Spirit says, and it's almost like a, a medium type of thing. Now, can God work that way? Yes. Is that the norm? The gift is a word of wisdom, verbalizing wisdom. Is that some gift where you're just sitting around doing it, and all of a sudden, boom, a word of wisdom pops into your head? Remember our formative teaching. We have been taken captive. We have been given gifts and given back. We are gifts. We're not just these open things with nothing in, and all of a sudden this gift pops in and that gift pops in. That doesn't fit with any biblical teaching. I'm keeping my finger on the text, folks. If you don't like it, think of what I'm saying and go back to the Scripture and check it out. I know someone who has the gift of wisdom. You know how I know? This person, whenever you give him a situation that is extremely complex and just a quagmire, he will listen and he'll say, you know, here's what the real issue is, and here's really what should be done about it. And you go, you're right. And I've seen this in, in a person consistently. You know what it is? It's the gift of wisdom. He is that gift given to the church for the building up of the body of Christ. The Evangelical Free Church has a guy on staff who has the gift of knowledge. You know, a word of knowledge. Some people think a word of knowledge is you're sitting there and all of a sudden a word of knowledge you didn't have before pops into your head. Where did that thought come from? It's knowledge spoken. There's a guy named Greg Strand in the Evangelical Free Church. He is our kind of resident theologian. John Eisenhower knows him. He played basketball for John in college. But at any rate, uh, Greg is one of those guys where... If you bring up something like a theological point, he will, he will, off the top of his head, tell you everywhere in Scripture it is mentioned. And then he'll go into the history of the church and say, and it was discussed at the Third Council, Third Ecumenical Council at Laodicea, and St. Nicholas of, of so-and-so said this, and Athanasius said this in reply, and, and then in the, in the Fourth Ecumenical Council at Smyrna, you, you know, and it's off the top of his head, and you're going, what is this? He can read something. And he'll remember it, and he'll even tell you a week later what page to look on. I know nothing of that gift. <laughs> I would have to read something five or six times and take copious notes to have any chance at something like that. This guy's got it. It's the gift of knowledge. His brain has the ability to sort and store and retrieve more information than mine has learned in my lifetime. In about ten minutes, he can learn that. Uh, and he uses that in the body of Christ. He's kind of the, the resident theologian in the free church for that reason. Uh, we gift of prophecy. We think of prophecy, we immediately think, oh, foretelling. And we get almost to an occult thing of, yeah, someone's going to come in and you're going to read their mail. Like They're going to look at you and say, oh, you're going to... Well, you know what? Spirit can do that. When Paul was going around and he was going to be jailed, everywhere he went, the Spirit of God was saying, you're destined for chains. But it was the repetitive nature of that that proved it was prophecy. But you know in Scripture, 80% of prophecy is not foretelling, it's forthtelling. Thus says the Lord. The gift of prophecy practiced most regularly is preaching, proclaiming the Word of God. When Moses was complaining to God that he didn't talk well, Moses said, no problem, Aaron will come along, he'll be your prophet. He'll speak for you. Prophecy is speaking for God. Now, can he just bring something in that's going to happen? Oh, he, yes, Absolutely. 
By, we never want to limit God in these things, by the way. And with the gifts of the Spirit, don't limit the gifts of the Spirit. He can do whatever He wants. He can give us a gift temporarily to, in, in, in a time of need that we will need at a certain time and then withdraw it later. He can do whatever He wants because the Spirit gives us He wills. But we don't get to choose any of that. We are just recipients. So anyway, the gifts, the gifts are, some of the gifts are listed there. And notice with like healings, there's a plurality of healings. You know, there, there's all different kinds of healings. There's not one way to heal. Some people with the gift of healing may be people that go into the medical fields. There's a variety of kinds of tongues. There's different types of tongues. Some gift of tongues might be a, a, a supernatural ability to learn languages fast. Boy, what a blessing on the mission field. What a blessing for the body of Christ. Uh, let's keep our finger on the text and not limit these things, but not say more than what the text says. Now we have this wonderful illustration of the body. How does this all fit together? How are we to understand how these gifts work? If you start in uh, verse 12, For even as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Who's the we? It's the church. If your theology has a, if your, your view of the gifts has a theology that says you can be a member of the body but not yet be baptized into Christ, you better go back and check your scripture. It is the baptism of Jesus Christ, which is the baptism of the Spirit, which brings us in to the kingdom of God. Because we were all baptized with, by, into one body. Verse 14, for the body is not one member but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, is it for any reason less a part of the body? If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, am I not a part of the body? It is not any... For this reason, any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were the hearing, where would the smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members in one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member that lacked, that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same care for one another. When one suffers, all members suffer with it. When one is honored, all members are honored. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Get the idea of the body. We're different. We're gifted differently. We are graced differently we're given different measures of christ's gift but christ is doing it to make us a one body building up itself in love as we see god working in each and every one of us in different ways with different needs filling different capacities and that's what the gifts of the spirit are all about therefore body building and we do not look down on any gifts of the spirit we do not uh, consider any gifts of the Spirit more important than any other. They are all crucial. I said it last week. The person who stands up and preaches to 10,000 people is not one iota more important in the kingdom of God than the person that cleans out the cupboards of the kitchen when no one's around. Equally important in their gifting and in their faithfulness to which he has called them. In fact, we should bestow more abundant honor on them instead of the ones that have the big stage and platform out in front of people. That's what the body of Christ is all about. That's what Jesus taught. You want to be first, be last. You want to be great, be a servant. It's radical teaching, but it's empowered by the Spirit of God. Verse 28. Okay, here we go. Now God has appointed in the church, and he lists things in an order here, which means an importance. Now, we know already it cannot possibly that one gift is greater than the other. We've already established that clearly and thoroughly. Yet, in that context, there are some that are more crucial to have in your church. Remember last week, Ephesians 4, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, the ones that set the bones straight, 
so that the church will grow properly, so all the gifts will be free to be unleashed in the, their proper way that God wants them to? Guess which ones he says? First and second and third. He doesn't list all five like in Ephesians. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. These are all people that deal with the word of God. The apostles are the ones sent with the word of God. The prophets are the ones that proclaim the word of God. The teachers are the ones that teach the word of God. Then, and then there's a then, there's no more numerical, and he lists a whole bunch of them. Then, after that, there is, there is miracles, gifts of healings, helps, plural, all different. Let's not limit God by gifts of the Spirit. There is, there's zillions of ways he has gifted us to be helpers, to just do what needs to be done without complaining, without growing weary. Those are gifts of the Spirit. Administrations. People that just kind of figure out how to put things in order in multiple ways. This is one reason why I am not a big fan of those lists and surveys of gifts of the Spirit where you look and here's this list of the gifts and pick out which ones you think are yours. Uh, you know, for one thing, this list is not, there's no exhaustive list in Scripture. God can do whatever he needs to do. And the way these things, many of these are listed in plurality means there's more than we could ever count. Secondly, we don't get to pick them. So what's the purpose of going down a list and saying, oh, I like this one and that one? And in fact, if you want to use those, the best way to use those, if you have one of those surveys, give it to five or six or seven or ten of your very close friends that know you and ask them what they see in you. Now, that, that's, a, that's how to use those surveys. Then, Because they will recognize. That, that's part of what we do in the church is recognize gifts to unleash them. That's the concept of laying on of hands. Again, we, we, almost, we almost put an occult thing on the laying on of hands, like you're zapping people with power. Laying on of hands is recognizing and unleashing a gift of the Spirit. When Paul and Barnabas were ministering in Antioch, the Holy Spirit said to the leadership team, set apart these guys for this ministry of being sent. And they prayed and fasted, and then, being convinced, they laid hands on them and sent them out. Recognition and an unleashing of the gift. Brothers and sisters, we should be doing that with one another. We should be regularly laying on of hands and saying, I see this gift in you. You need to be doing this. You need to make this a priority. You're getting bogged down with all this other stuff that you see that needs to be done. But man, here's what I see God has gifted you to do. You, don't, you wouldn't believe how much you can set a brother or sister free by doing something like that. If I keep going this way, we're going to be going really long today. So I better move on. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? Do they all speak with, they don't all speak with tongues, do they? They don't all interpret, do they? No. That's the body illustration. He is gifted. Now, tongues, I know, there's alarms and bells going off in some of you. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Earnestly desire the greater gifts. Now, wait a minute. He said before, clearly, the Holy Spirit decides. God does just as he chooses. Why is he telling us to desire the greater gifts? Which, by the way, are clearly apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, shepherd. Those are the gifts that are most crucial. They're the ones that set the bones straight. Sometimes we get that backwards and consider the lesser gifts the most important. The, the, as he says, the, the greater gifts. They're, they're greater in importance to the church. They're not greater in value. We already know that. But why does he tell us to earnestly desire them? It's not for us. It's not, oh, I wish I had that gift. That is earnestly desire in your fellowship. This is a body thing. Earnestly desire that your fellowship has these apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teachers that set the bone straight for the rest of us. That's what he's saying there. There's no other way of defining the greater gifts with what he says above and also what he says in Ephesians. But then he says, let me show you an even better way. And then we get to chapter 13. We already looked at 13 several weeks ago. What it says basically is, well, I'll just read the first few verses. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith so as to remove mountains but don't have love, zero. I am nothing. If I give my possessions to feed the poor and if I surrender my body to be burned, if I become a martyr but do not have love, 
There's no profit there. Astonishing statements. Why? Because love is the purpose of all this. Each one of us serving as we have been called by God to do. We are his workmanship. He is doing things that he prepared beforehand for us to be, taking us captive, giving us back to the church as we're doing, if we're obedient to him and doing what he created us to do, the body builds itself up in love. That's the goal. If that's not, if that's not what you're headed for, you're on the wrong track. If you're exercising gifts like crazy and it's not resulting in love, you're missing it. You're on the wrong road. And then he talks about what love is. But what I want to point out when we get lower on down below in chapter 13, there are some of you have been taught the gifts, some of the gifts have ceased. Right? When the scripture became, was, was, was uh, recognized as scripture, we no longer needed some of those gifts. Usually the ones you don't like or the ones you don't understand. And it comes from this passage because it's, it's read this way. As we go down to uh, verse 8, it says, Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there's knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Some say the perfect coming is the perfect word of God. When that was there, the others just kind of went by the wayside. By the way, and this amazes me, There are some really intelligent, really excellent theologians that believe this. It boggles my mind because, well, let's go on. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known. That's when the perfect comes. Now. Could that possibly be when Scripture was decided on as what officially are the books of the Bible? And now the perfect has come, and now we know as we have been fully known? No, that can't possibly be. You mean we no longer see through a glass darkly? I know I do. I'm still learning day by day. It can, this passage cannot possibly be referring to Scripture being identified and therefore the gift ceasing. What this is saying is when we get to glory, we don't need the gifts anymore. Therefore, here and now on this earth, because they are but the baton passed to us so that we might seek and save the lost like Jesus until he comes again, then there's no more need for that. So I want to put that one away. And it amazes me, some people way smarter than me really believe that. But when I put my finger on the text, I say, it can't possibly. And aside that, that would mean certain extensive passages of Scripture were only for one generation of Christians. Why are they in there? You know, Paul wrote other letters that are not in, in our Scripture. We know that First and Second Corinthians are at least the second and fourth letters he wrote to Corinth because they refer to letters that weren't the other ones. Why wasn't that, if that's the case, just delivered to these churches and not encapsulated in Scripture for all ages to deal and grapple with? No, it, it's absurd. If you've been taught that and you're struggling with what I'm saying now, just go back and read the Scripture. It, it's an amazing thing that people believe that. The gifts are still the gifts. Now, are there different emphases in different times? Yes. God does as He wills for His good pleasure. And so at any rate... That's, I wanted to, to state that. Oh, I love summertime because we can go a little bit long, but <sighs> I'm trying to make a decision now because we're, com- we're going to talk about tongues next, specifically, tongues and prophecy. I'll start out, and we have to finish up next week because we have the Lord's table to do, but you guys don't have anywhere else to go today, do you? <laughs> I'm tempted to do a popular vote, but no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Okay, one of of the great issues of division, obviously. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, the gift of tongues. Uh, Why is it there? Why why is it that some believe that every Christian that has the Holy Spirit will speak in tongues? And yet what we see here is not everyone speaks in tongues. Well, someone who's involved in the Pentecostal movement would say, well, there's two kinds. There's, There's the gift of tongues, and there's the reception of the Holy Spirit, Pentecostal kind of tongues, which... Okay, that, that would make sense. The problem is that that's a view that when you start talking about the gifts of the Spirit, you start at Pentecost. 
which really was not a spiritual gift. What happened to Pentecost was not a gift of the Spirit. It was a manifestation of a major epochal event in the history, salvation history of mankind. It was the inauguration of nothing less than the new covenant. It was the beginning of the baptism of Jesus and the born-again kingdom of God church. And it was demonstrated by this amazing thing where all these guys at the same time were speaking in other tongues and everybody from other nations was hearing them in their mother tongue without even a Galilean accent. A miracle of God that drew attention and Peter stood up and proclaimed Jesus Christ and 2,000 believed in that day and they were baptized and it says when you're baptized you'll receive the Holy Spirit. So they received the Holy Spirit but what was emphasized? Did they speak in tongues, those 2,000? If they did, it wasn't worth mentioning. What did we see? We saw changed lives. The same thing happened when the first Gentiles came into the kingdom with Peter and Cornelius. When he saw the sheet and he got the message from God and he went to Cornelius and while he was speaking, they received the Holy Spirit and it was another Pentecost. The Jerusalem church said, wait a minute here, Gentiles, I don't think so. He had to go to Jerusalem and talk with them and the evidence he said that persuaded them was when I was speaking, they received the Holy Spirit in the same way we did back at the beginning. And Greek verbs are very precise. He could have used a verb tense that says, the same way we have been receiving the Spirit. He clearly said, we received the way we did, and then he added for emphasis, back at the beginning. That was another Pentecost. The third one were disciples of John, who were called disciples. They were hanging out with the church. They were part of the church. And something in them, when Paul talked to him, motivated him to ask a really weird question. Into what baptism were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. Not Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? He proclaimed the truth to them. They had a Pentecostal experience. Really interesting people group there because people who are involved in the church, if you will, but not born again. Emphasizing, you know what? Being a church member and coming to church every Sunday doesn't make you in the kingdom of God. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we see those three times. If indeed everyone who receives the Holy Spirit speaks in tongues, that's a really, really, really important thing, is it not? I mean, that's really important. It's not mentioned in any of the Gospels. Jesus did not, if, if Jesus spoke in tongues when he was baptized, when that dove came down, boy, he'd have a strong case. And don't, please don't talk to me about Mark chapter 16. Look at your Bibles. If you have a Bible worth anything, there'll be brackets around that passage or a footnote that says, this passage is not contained in the earliest and best manuscripts. People that study the, the linguistics to determine what is the, the closest to the original Bible are 99% sure the end of chapter, Mark, chapter 16 of Mark should not be in our scripture. Why is it there? Because it was in the copy that the King James people had when they had one copy of the New Testament to basically translate. And it's been stuck there ever since because... Unfortunately, making Bibles is a money-making thing, and no one wants to make a Bible where, where a good chunk of the church accuses them of changing the Word of God. So King James is still with us, even in a couple places where it should be corrected. By the way, that's why we still have uh, inns at the uh, nativity scenes in Bethlehem, even though they're nowhere in the text, nowhere in the Greek text. They're in King James Bible. <laughs> but that's, at any rate, oh, don't get me started. Okay. Uh, at any rate... Nowhere in the Gospels is tongues even mentioned. In Romans, not mentioned. 1 Corinthians, these chapters we're looking at, corrective chapters. 2 Corinthians, not mentioned. Galatians, not mentioned. Ephesians, not mentioned. Philippians, no. Colossians, no. Philemon, no. The Timothys, no. The Thessalonians, no. Titus, no. Hebrews, no. I'll go on the rest of the way. Not mentioned. Can it possibly be that important? Or maybe have we become a little misguided in our studying scriptures? So what about tongues then? Chapter 14, 1 Corinthians. Pursue love. Hey, here we go. You know, it said, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. I say, that doesn't mean try to get them. That means wish that you had them. Now here he says, try to get this. Pursue this. Go after love. Go after love with all you got. Try to get love. Work for love. 
but earnestly desire spiritual gifts, that your church has them. But especially that you may prophesy. For the one who prophesies, for the one who speaks in a tongue, does not speak to men but to God. No one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But the one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. Edification, exhortation, consolation. It's one of those gifts that sets the bones straight so that the rest of the body might grow properly. The one who speaks in a tongue, verse 4, edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. So I said, you know, these are not for you except some kind of are. Let me tell you a story that really opened this passage up to me, a true life story. <clears throat> Many of you remember Betty Larson, Wes and Betty. Many of you have been here a long time. Wes and Betty, wonderful members of our church for many years. Betty told a really interesting story at one of our Bible studies. She said, there was a time in my life when I began speaking in tongues. In my devotions, I just began speaking in tongues. I didn't try to get it. It just came upon me. And she said, it's the most beautiful thing I ever experienced in my life. I have never felt closer to God. And she said, and shortly after that, life circumstances turned, and I, I found myself going through the most difficult life situation I have ever been through. She didn't say what it was. <clears throat> but she said, during that time, that gift of tongues got me through. That propped me up. That just gave me the, the, the ability to get through that season. When that season resolved... The tongues left. She couldn't do it anymore. She tried. She wanted to. It was beautiful. Most beautiful thing she ever experienced. Never closer to God. It was gone. And this was many years ago. She said, to this day, I've never spoken in a tongue. He gave it, and he took it, and it was for a reason. I needed it. And I look at this passage now in Corinthians 14 and say, I get it. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. It is a beautiful personal gift that will help you do whatever God is, wants you to go through or wants you to do. And it goes on to say, Paul says a couple different times in verse 5, I wish that all spoke in tongues. And then he says down in verse uh, 18, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Paul, Paul had that gift. Paul had that help. Paul had that closeness to God that he gives to some for his purposes. We can understand how Paul could say, you know what? I, he wouldn't even want to say his own name. I know a guy, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, who went up to the third heaven and saw things humans are not supposed to see that I can't even tell you about. But because of that, I was given a thorn in the flesh that I tried to pray away to be healed, and I realized it was given me to keep me humble because how are you going to win a theological argument with someone who's been to the third heaven? Uh, so I can understand that now. Paul had that. What a wonderful gift. Some of you in this room have that gift, and don't you wish everybody did? I know you do, because it's that beautiful, and it's still here today. I wish I had it. There was a time in my life when I sought it. God spoke to me and through going through his word and through his spirit and said, Bob, be satisfied with the gifts I give you and do them. If I want you to have that one, you will. Because that's what the gifts are. So chapter 14 is basically, it's a, it's a long chapter. And it basically talks about why in the gathered community, now tongues being more of a private and personal gift, in the gathered community, it's of very, very little value. What you want is prophecy. That's why interpretation is important with tongues. And it goes on, and I, I don't want to take any longer, so if, if you go on and read chapter 14, he gives some instructions for the church when it gathers. And he says, okay, if there's, there's, prob there's people speaking God's word, that's great. If there's going to be tongues, two, maybe three at the most, and one at a time, and if there's not interpretation, shut your trap. That's basically the rules for the gathered community. And so that's that's what we have as the corrective teaching of 1 Corinthians because that, that prophecy has the great value for everyone of that uh, edification, uh, all those wonderful things that, that build up the body of Christ, exhortation, consolation. Uh, so what do we say then about all this, this elephant in the room of the tongues? Is it a legitimate gift? You can't say it's not. 
Do I wish I had it? Yes, I do. If you have it, you are blessed. But we, we are all gifts in our own ways. And it doesn't mean you're one iota more spiritual than anybody else or have one iota more of the Holy Spirit than anybody else. With the Holy Spirit, you either have Him or you don't. Now, we may be following the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to lead us more than others. And some of us may be quenching or grieving the Spirit, but we all have the same measure of Spirit. But we're all gifted differently. So then how do you find out what your gift is? Other than have one of those surveys and give it to 10 friends and ask them to say, what am I? It's very, very simple. Don't try to do a gift. You want to know what your gift is? Draw near to Jesus Christ. Grow in your intimacy with him so that you can hear his voice. And as you hear his voice, obey it. And you will be doing your, you will be being your gift. You'll be being the gift that you are. And every one of us is absolutely necessary if the body wants to grow and build itself up in love. Draw near to Jesus Christ. Grow, seek to grow in intimacy with him so that you can hear his voice more clearly and when you hear it, obey it. And you won't need any survey. You will be being the gift that he is making and has made and has beforehand decided you should be what you should be doing in his body for the building up of itself in love. Okay, let's pray.